Later this week, the House of Representatives may begin work on its fiscal year 1993 budget resolution, the Congressional Blueprint for Taxes and Spending. Last week, the Budget Committee approved two plans for the House to consider. One would shift spending from defense to domestic programs, and one would use defense savings for deficit reduction. Earlier today, the House Rules Committee met to go over the budget resolution, to set guidelines for the debate on it, and to discuss discretionary spending for the next fiscal year. Next on C-SPAN 2, we will take you to Capitol Hill for coverage of the Rules Committee meeting. We begin with the panel's discussion on the rules for debate and discretionary spending. Discretionary spending is the money available to Congress to use after allowing for the funding of mandatory programs. Massachusetts Representative Joseph Moakley is the chairman of the House Rules Committee. committee will now come to order on H.R. 3732. The Rules Committee is meeting this morning on H.R. 3732, the Budget Process Reform Act of 1992. At today's meeting, we will consider the bill as an original jurisdiction measure only. We will meet at a later date to grant a rule. There will be an extension of yesterday's 5 p.m. deadline for filing of amendments, as I've discussed with the uh, ranking minority leader. And we will not have any witnesses today, but we'll proceed directly to mark up the bill. At 2 p.m. today, we'll meet to grant a rule on the budget resolution. The purpose of H.R. 3732 is to amend the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 to eliminate a division of discretion discretionary appropriations into three categories for the purpose of discretionary spending limit for fiscal year 1993. Now, if you're like me, a sentence like the previous one causes my eyes to glaze over and makes me think about what time we're going to eat lunch. <laughs> the bottom line is that this bill will let us use Defense savings to give our domestic economy a critical jump start it needs to help stimulate business, create new jobs, and put us on the road to financial recovery. Let me give a little background on this bill and how we got here. As you know, under the 1990 Budget Summit, Cong Summit Congress and the President reached a, an agreement to help control spending in the federal budget. The agreement known as the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, or the BEA, set up three individual discretionary categories with caps on spending for domestic, defense, and international appropriations. The so-called firewalls were put in place between each of the three categories to ensure that if any appropriations category exceeded the spending ceiling set for that area, it would trigger an across-the-board sequester only in that category. Funding for the individual programs and services in these three areas could be reduced or increased only from within each category. Money could not be taken from one category to fund the other. The BEA further provided that any net reduction within each category could only be used for deficit reduction. These separate category caps were to remain in place through fiscal year 1993 and then be folded together into a single cap discretionary sp spending category for fiscal years 1994 and 1995. And that's how the budget agreement was designed to work 
on the discretionary spending side. Other restrictions were put in place on the pay-go side. Pay-as-you-go restrictions included in the package required that any new tax cuts, new entitlement programs, or other funding increases be deficit neutral, offset either by tax increases or cutbacks in entitlement spending. Again, that is how the Budget Enforcement Act agreed upon by Congress and the President was designed to operate. But there was one minor oversight of that budget summit. All of the participants left their crystal balls at home. Not surprisingly, none of the budget summit participants predicted that in the 16 months since the agreement was enacted that Eastern Europe would spin out of the Soviet orbit, the Warsaw Pact would disband, the United States would fight and win a war against Iraq, the Soviets would undergo a coup attempt only to lapse into dissolution, and the United States would enter into a prolonged recession and Americans would be badly shaken by the uncertainty of their economic future. And that is precisely what this bill addresses. This bill is designed to conform the 1990 budget agreement to the realities of 1992. As the President emphasized in his State of the Union address, the Cold War is over. Our number one threat is no longer communism, an attack from abroad, but deterioration of our economic stability. Now we must use our limited resources to address the challenge we face at home. We need to be able to compete in a global marketplace, beginning with the improvement of our children's education to restoring the competitiveness of our nation's businesses. Our domestic economy has worsened considerably since 1990. A recession has been in place for over a year. Unemployment has skyrocketed, and new job opportunities are just not emerging to replace those that have disappeared. We need to reverse the erosion of our economic base. Far too many middle-class families are now out of work and turning to federal programs such as extended employment and other government services for relief. And between December of 1990 and December of 1991, a staggering 3.16 million Americans were added to the food stamp rolls. This past November alone saw 373,000 new recipients. Each subsequent month, breaks new records for food stamp use. This bill could allow for defense savings to be used for reinvestment and job creation. This bill could allow us to move from more recession to more jobs. Yet, because of the well-intentioned 1990 agreement and its firewalls, we are unable to use the defense savings for anything except deficit reduction. H3732 still maintains a cap on discretionary spending. It only calls for combining the three categories into one single category, something that was already slated to happen under the BEA of fiscal year 1994. This measure, simply stated, accelerates that process by one year. It's time to put aside partisan differences, to fix the agreement, to meet the needs of today and not the outdated priorities of the past. Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you as the chairman of our Rules Committee and uh, our leader uh, for claiming jurisdiction over this government operations uh, bill, uh, which uh, we certainly have uh, every right to mark up. And when you became the chairman, you said you were going to claim these jurisdictions, and, uh, and we, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, the, um, secondly, uh, Mr. Chairman, the um, administration is opposed to this bill, and I would ask you now, Smith, to submit Without their, objection. Uh, and they will veto it, so this may be an act in futility. And uh, third, uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that the Cold War was over. And, you know, there are 10,000 
or more armed nuclear warheads aimed at Boston, Massachusetts, and New York, and uh, every other major city in the United States. Los Angeles as well. <laughs> Who else have we got? How about Tennessee? And <laughs> the, uh, in there, addition... Is there one name that aimed at Edgefield, South Carolina? I think there yeah. might, I think there were, you could almost be assured of it. <laughs> especially, especially when you look at the, uh, at the Soviet technology. I mean, uh, it, uh, they used it in, uh, in Iraq on the Scud missiles, uh, you know, and uh, those things went awry. And uh, I'm sure one could hit, hit South Carolina there someplace. <laughs> Uh, in addition, you know, there are four million men under arms in the Soviet Army. Uh, God knows where they are and, uh, and who has uh, jurisdiction over them. Uh, in addition, uh, it's a very unstable Russian feder confederacy. Uh, in other words, nobody knows where that's going or who's going to control it. You know, that's one thing. Secondly, you know, there are more than 10 anti-American, hostile, terrorist nations out there, and you know, you can name them, uh, uh, everybody sitting here, you know, whether it's Iran or Iraq or uh, Libya, that either have or are on the verge of having nuclear missile capability. Again, you know, the threat out there may not be a world war uh, uh, situation, but any one of those countries could tomorrow advance a sneak attack on Americans any place in the world. And you, you, we could talk on about that. But lastly, you know, the last time I looked, half the people of this world were still enslaved under atheistic, deadly communism. You want to look at the countries? You got Cuba, you got North Korea, you got Vietnam, you got mainland China, and that is not a threat to mankind. Well, Mr. Chairman, I could go on, but let's get on to the bill that's before us. If, if I, Terry, I'd be glad to yield it to him. I stated the president in the State of the Union address is saying the Cold War is over. Fine, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say this. For the, for the second and third time in two weeks, this Committee on Rules is being asked to bless legislation which breaks the 1990 Budget Act, the enforcement agreement that many of you here voted for. I didn't. Uh, last week, we approved the so-called Economic Growth Bill that exempted some $30 billion in increased deficits over the next two years from the pay-as-you-go requirements of the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990. And today, this committee is being asked again to report this bill, a bill that demolishes the fiscal 1993 firewalls, Joe, that you've spoken about, that separate defense spending from domestic and international operations or uh, appropriations spending. But even more shocking to me is the fact that we are also being asked by the Budget Committee, by the Budget Committee to grant a rule on a concurrent resolution on the budget, which gives us two congressional budgets, two budgets for fiscal 1993, one with firewalls and one without. I've been here 14 years. I don't know how long all of you have been here. You never saw that happen before. What has this place come to when the majority leadership and majority Democrats from three major committees, three major committees, conspire to trash a solemn budgetary agreement that is only 16 months old in order to permit more spending and higher deficits. Mr. Chairman, the reason I'm so appalled at this legislation is because, as reported in the nationwide press, the Democrat leadership had sworn they swore to uphold that Budget Enforcement Act requirements back in 1990 in return for President Bush agreeing to raise taxes. Remember how he was pushed into it? Because you swore that you would uphold this agreement. And I'm sure he would never have gone along with those kind of tax increases if he didn't think the Congress was going to live up to its word as men and women, as honorable men and women. Moreover, we, had to, we were told back then that the Budget Committee would work to uphold that Budget Enforcement Act in its budget resolutions, and that this Rules Committee, that's you and me, gentlemen and ladies, would uphold the Budget Act rule as they apply to this House. Mr. Chairman, we used to criticize the, the, the Soviet Communists for never making an agreement that they didn't break. And as far as I know, they broke every one of them. We shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. But this is the second time when the Democrat majority leadership of the United States House of Representatives has walked away from its word. The first time being in the early 1980s. You were here, 
when we suppose to cut spending by $2 for every $1 in additional taxes? The spending cuts never materialized, and Congress, as it always does, ended up spending every nickel of that tax increase, and they didn't cut spending one thin dime. Now, Mr. Chairman, it's already abundantly clear that the Budget Committee Democrats are interested in cutting defense to dangerously low levels, primarily for the purpose of increasing spending in their pet domestic areas. That's what this bill here does today, and you all have said so. As I understand it, this is reflected in the Plan A budget contained in the split-level budget resolution we are being asked to send to the floor here today. Mr. Chairman, it is my understanding that Representative Stenholm and Lucan, members of your party, along with a large number of their Democrat colleagues, I think there were more than 40 of them, have written to the Speaker strongly urging that any peace dividend be dictated, uh, dedicated exclusively to reducing our $362 billion deficit. They have introduced a resolution, I think it's uh, Resolution 233, urging the Congress and the administration to do just that. To quote from their letter, this is from the Democrat letter of Charlie Stenholm now, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Quote, the deficit does more to slow down our economy than any tax cut or any infrastructure investment could begin to offset. There, they go on to say there is a remarkable consensus among economists on this point. And their letter goes on to say we have an obligation to the taxpayers and the children of this nation to stop this compulsive spending and to make real efforts towards eliminating our deficit, end quote. That's what their letter said. Now, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, at the appropriate time, I intend to offer in markup here one of the amendments submitted to this committee by our Republican leader, Bob Michael, that would ensure the goal of dedicating any defense savings exclusively to deficit reduction. You cut the defense budget, it goes towards the deficit. That is the single most important step we can take to end this recession and put this country and its economy back on solid growth tracks. Mr. Chairman, I will also be offering an amendment to give any president, any president, whoever it might be in the future, line item veto authority. If this Congress wants to renege on its promise to the American people to use that peace dividend to cut the deficit, then I believe that the President of the United States ought to have the right to line item veto those items and let us reconsider them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time when we get into the markup, I would offer those two amendments, and I appreciate the indulgence of the committee. I'd be glad to yield to the gentleman from California. Thank you very much. I'd uh, like to say, Mr. Chairman, that I think that that Mr. Solomon has raised some important points, and you were absolutely right in quoting President Bush's State of the Union message when he said the Cold War is over, and he was right in that statement. But he also, in that State of the Union message, paraphrased Plato when he said, only the dead have seen the end of conflict. And he said that he was going to uh, call for a $50 billion reduction in the level of defense expenditures, and no further, and tragically, this budget proposal, which has come from the committee, calls for cuts that are nearly twice that, $90 billion. And I think that that is a, a very unfortunate thing. And as we look towards bringing about reductions in defense and possibly utilizing the so-called peace dividend for expenditures in other areas, uh, we should be very, very careful. And uh, I think that's the point that Mr. Solomon was trying to make, and I uh, congratulate him for it. I thank the chairman. I yield my time. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> You know, to accuse uh, the Democrats of, of breaking the uh, budget agreement is absurd. The President has already violated it by using accounting gimmicks to make up for over $7 billion in the FY1993 uh, budget. And, you know, it, it goes on. The President in the FY1993 requested and asked for major changes in the budget process, the line item veto, balanced budget amendment, requirement for presidential approval of budget uh, resolution, and enhanced precision authority. So let's quit uh, sitting here and accusing each other of this and that. The fact of the matter is that when the budget uh, agreement was agreed to, the world was entirely different than it is today. Uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union, although it had started to crumble, had never gotten to the level that it is now. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, it, we, would be, uh, we would be shirking our responsibility to this nation and to, to our constituents 
if we didn't take the relevant changes as major as they are that have happened in the world since the budget agreement into consideration as we write uh, uh, budgets. Uh, I don't know, uh, I, uh, I, I hesitate to quote it, but uh, we all know the quotation of, of Shakespeare on consistency for consistency's sake. Consistency for consistency's sake is no good. What, it, what that does is says that we have no minds of our own and we can't make judgments as changes come about. So let's not sit here and accuse each other of that. We both know the President has violated the budget agreement if we want to put it there. But it, there are significant changes that have come about in the world that need to be addressed. Thank you. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that there is uh, a distinct difference of means between an effort by the president to control excessive spending and reduce the deficit and violating the budget agreement. The budget agreement said that expenditures shall not exceed certain limits and certain caps. By the president calling for a line item veto and enhanced rescission in order to control the deficit uh, is in no way a violation of the budget agreement unless one has very, very convoluted views as to what the purpose of the agreement was. The purpose of the agreement was to control spending. If the President gives to the Congress new suggestions as to how to control spending, then it is an enforcement, an endorsement, a support for the budget agreement. Now, if uh, there are many of us that opposed it in the first place, said the President of the United States should never uh, try to make a deal with, with folks that aren't going to honor it. And uh, now we come back and say that it's an enlightened thing to do to violate your word and go back on your commitment and ignore it, uh, that uh, that's merely consistency for consistency's sake. Uh, that concept of honor and that definition of, of uh, one's word is one that uh, many of us feared would come. And now it's up to George Bush uh, to weigh in on this and to say that those of us that warned him, I told you so, uh, to say that uh, he's going to have to use his efforts because he's the one that uh, got into this room. He's the one that came to us and said we have an agreement. He's the one that said that the, the group with which I uh, made this deal will honor it. He's the one that went on nationwide television with George Mitchell and said that we have given our word and we intend to keep it. And for those of us that were skeptics then are now abundantly uh, uh, affirmed by what we hear today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As, as usual, I wasn't going to say anything, but I've been inspired by our friends over there to replay it, at, at least in part. Let me start off simply by saying that our friend, Mr. Derrick, South Carolina, is absolutely correct. Times have changed radically, and as he put it, it would, it would be absolutely irresponsible of us a year and a half subsequent to the time that we entered into this particular agreement and this bill was signed into law not to take notice of the vast changes that have occurred throughout the world and of the vast vastly additional needs here at home. If you go back home to your town meetings, you talk to the folks back home, there's no doubt at all that uh, they want us to take whatever we possibly can in the way of savings from defense or elsewhere and start investing some of that money in necessary programs here at home, which for the past 10 or 12 years have been starved of, of uh, resources. That basically is what this, what, this bill, <coughs> excuse me, what this bill would allow us to do. Mr. Solomon noted, and I guess my friend Mr. McEwen too, uh, that some of our friends on the other side of the aisle here were, were not, you know, did not support the budget agreement a year and a half ago. It seems to me that gives them very little standing to suggest what should or should not be done with it. Uh, those of us who supported it and still in, in effect uh, do, it seems to me, have absolutely every right in the world uh, to take notice, judicial notice as it were, legislative notice of changed circumstances and to amend uh, such a such a bill. We're not we're not throwing it out. We're amending it to a very modest extent. Even if these changes were made, were to be made and signed into law, the ones in the bill before us, proposed in the bill before us, were to be made by the Congress and and, and signed into law by the President. Uh, the net difference would be that we'd be able to spend somewhere between six and eight billion dollars in defense spending, in defense savings this year on domestic discretionary programs. That's it. We'd still be saving the half trillion dollars uh, we still be lowering the deficits, total, total amount of deficit spending in this country over the next five years, over these five years starting last year, by a half trillion dollars, less that six or eight 
uh, billion. So we're still on course to the to a vast extent with respect to the uh, to what that uh, original agreement uh, provided us with. We're we're still saving an immense amount of money, and uh, as I said, we're talking about a we're talking about making available only somewhere between six and eight billion dollars to invest in education and job training and new jobs and infrastructure that we would not otherwise be able to do. Uh, this is not the place to discuss it. Uh, but in fact, what the gentlemen on the other side are, are arguing is that we cannot sensibly or wisely cut defense beyond what the president has suggested. And I would suggest that a great number of observers out there from both sides of the aisle and on all all parts of the political spectrum can make a very strong case, as could we if we had more time to do it and if it were germane, Mr. Chairman, that in fact the threats that face us are real, but they're smaller, they're different. They no longer require anything like the 290 to 300 billion dollars a year in, in appropriations that we've been that we've been used to. That we that we can perfectly safely cut defense by the 10 to 15 billion dollars a year in addition that's being suggested by the uh, by the budget resolution. But that's that needs not be argued here. That all, all we're all, all we're saying, Mr. Derrick and I and the others of us who are supportive of this bill, that times do change. And there's absolutely nothing wrong or incon inconsistent with our, our supporting a, an amendment which makes a, seeks to make a very slight change in that budget agreement which we, which we supported last year and which, uh, uh, in essence, we continue to support very strongly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman? No, Mr. Solomon recognized me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, th there seems to be a little confusion here and I think that we need to underscore the fact that every member of this side of the aisle clearly recognizes that there have been dramatic changes which have taken place in the world in the last few years. I think that those of us on this side of the aisle are particularly proud of those changes as they've taken place under strong Republican leadership uh, at the helm. And we know that defense cuts need to be made. Uh, we are recognizing that. The President has not requested, Tony, 290 or 300. He's requested 284. And what we want to see is we want to see the defense cuts utilized for deficit reduction. Forty of your colleagues on the Democratic side have co-sponsored legislation calling for the utilization of these defense cuts for deficit reduction. We're very concerned about passing on to future generations the responsibility of paying for the profligate spending patterns which we've had here for the past several decades. And so I think that it's important for us to uh, realize that changes have taken place, cuts in the area of defense are going to take place. Our president called for those cuts, but he doesn't want them to go into an area which will jeopardize, as Mr. Solomon pointed out, the safety and security of the free world. So I think that we're uh, really also in a position where we had this agreement, and I guess all three of us on this side sitting here voted against that agreement. But I think, Tony, that we do have a right to clearly make changes in it as we wish. Now, we've made the change already on <clears throat> when it came to the scoring question. The agreement had the Office of Management and Budget responsible for scoring, and that was changed uh, by a vote of this House. And now we've got this proposal as it relates to the firewalls, allowing them to make changes in spending across the board. I would like to see, if we're going to modify the budget summit agreement, I would like to see us take what I think most of us would believe to be the most important step, and that is eliminate the largest tax increase in American history, which was the part that the President agreed to when the majority side here in the Congress forced him into the position of, we'll bring about the cuts if you'll go along with the tax increase. And I think that, that that's really the big change that I think most of us would like to see take place. Be happy to yield to my friend. You know, uh, I was just running down through this list because uh, uh, my good friend, Mr. Bielenson, I think, said that we were, we were picking on them. Uh, it isn't a question of, of picking on anybody. It's a question, as I look at all of these, uh, these Democrats that have signed this letter, which say they want, they want any peace dividend to go towards a deficit. You know, and you have, you have liberals on here, like Dennis Eckert, Frank Pallone, Louis Payne. You have conservatives on here, like Doug Barnard, Charlie Bennett. You have moderates. You know, this is a cross-section of your Democrat Party. They are the ones that would support my amendment, which I'm going to offer today, which is going to cut defense spending. 
by that that was asked for by Secretary Cheney, President Bush, and Colin Powell. And the latest poll in February said that only 18% of the American people wanted to take that peace dividend and spend any part of it on, on, on expenditures for federal programs. 18%. That means that most of the, of the Democrats in, out there in the hinterlands, and certainly most of the Republicans, want us to do that. So that's, that, Mr. Bielenson, is a point we've been trying to make, is that they want this money to go towards a deficit so that we can get this economy rolling, and that's one of the greatest deterrents today is that deficit. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't know whether this bill is going to pass or not or, or what the peace dividend might be, but I do hope that the, that the walls come down and that we have a little bit of money that um, hopefully can go towards the deficit. I would hope, though, uh, of that money, there would be a portion that would be set aside to the people that are really hurting the most. And we have anywhere in our cities and rural areas from 15 to 20 percent of the people that are uh, not only losing their job, but uh, they are in dire straits relative to just providing food and water for their own people. So I would hope that, uh, that we would consider uh, more money for the WIC program. Head Start, school nutrition programs, school lunch programs, uh, our food banks and soup kitchens. Uh, more and more people are coming to them every day. Uh, they're taking on four to 500,000 people every month under the food stamp program. We need changes in our welfare system. Our welfare system keeps our people down, forces people to cheat. We need new innovations like microenterprise projects. We're not talking about a lot of money here. A portion of this could go towards them. And so as we listen to Plato and Shakespeare being quoted today, I hope uh, that the Congress uh, listens to their heart and says that we really ought to be helping the poor, especially those working poor that have lost their jobs recently. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Chairman, as I said last week, uh, many Tennesseans are hurting and many Americans are hurting now. And I think it's important that we move forward uh, to provide some relief and get this economy going. And I think that the, uh, it's necessary that we get this budget completed and move forward. And so I will just limit my remarks to that so that we can, can move forward. Ms. Slaughter. No comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's the intention of the chair to recognize Mr. Derrick to offer a substitute to the pending bill after which the chair will recognize Mr. Derrick to offer her own amendment. Your microphone, please. It's the intention of the chair to recognize Mr. Derrick to offer a substitute of the pending bill, after which the chair will recognize members to offer amendments. Mr. Derrick. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee. <laughs> Both of us. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee adopt the Government Operations Committee substitute now printed in the bill. The bill and the substitute are available in members' folders. Are there any amendments uh, to the pending substitute of Mr. Derrick? Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I do have an amendment. It's the, uh, the uh, Republican amendment offered by uh, Mr. Bob Michael, our Republican leader. Uh, which would retain the firewall, which would uh, reduce defense spending by $7.4 billion in budgetary authority. And it is the sense of Congress that the savings realized from these lowered defense expenditures should be used to the maximum extent possible for reducing the federal deficit. Now, Mr. Chairman, that is what uh, the President has asked for. That's what Secretary Cheney has asked for. That is the, the military uh, defense budget plan. Uh, over the next five years, this would, would uh, create the $7.4 billion uh, reduction and would uh, guarantee that these monies would, would be used for deficit uh, reduction. Uh, I think you all understand the amendment, and uh, at the appropriate time, I would, uh, I would move that amendment, Mr. Chairman. Well, 
the is it is this your enhanced precision amendment is that is no 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 that's oh. uh the line item veto? Yeah. No, I would offer that one next. No, okay. this is a $7.4 billion cut for fiscal 1993. Right. Is there any discussion on the amendment of Mr. Solomon? Mr. Gillinson. Well, just very briefly, if I may, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Our friend Mr. Solomon, who just said we should not be changing the Budget Enforcement Act, the agreement of two years ago, a little less than two years ago, now offers to change it uh, by changing the figures, by changing the figures that were agreed to and the caps that were agreed to at that time by lowering the, the cap on, on defense expenditures, appropriations, so that it, it conforms to what Mr. Mr. Bush is suggesting is the, is the proper amount. And so, maintaining the firewalls. And maintaining the firewalls. But you're changing the, you're changing the figures we agreed to, the rest of us who assigned on to this a year and a half ago. You just told us we shouldn't be changing this. It's, now you're changing it. That's all I'm trying to suggest, Jerry, that you're being inconsistent. I'm not saying you shouldn't be inconsistent because we're being a little inconsistent too and it's perfectly all right in our case and I think it is in yours. But I'm just suggesting you're being inconsistent now too by changing this. <laughs> the, the president, oh boy. right, the, 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 the president's, what seems to me that, that, the, that the, res the proper response to your suggestion here is that this is not the place to debate it. The president's budget with his lower defense numbers, which is what you're proposing to, to put in effect here, will be before us on the floor later this week in the President's budget resolution. That will be made in order by this committee later today, I assume, so that anyone who believes in and, and supports the President's figure for defense spending will have an opportunity to vote for the President's budget and for the figures that, uh, that are in it. So I think that, I think it's, it's not that it's not germane, but I think it's not relevant really to the, to the process changes, the underlying process changes which are before us today will be perfectly relevant and will be in order uh, when we talk about this year's budget resolution and, and people's, uh, people's votes uh, on it. Would, would the gentleman yield? Of course. Uh, you know, I was taken by Tony Hall's statement over there that he hoped we would all have heart. And, you know, I hope we all are sincere in, in what we're trying to do here. You know, I mentioned that the Soviet Union has, still has four million men under arms. We in this country have two million men and women under arms. And you know what? Those are the finest young men and women ever to serve in an all-voluntary military. Do you know where they come from, Mr. Hall? They come from broken homes, many of them now, come from the inner cities. They come from broken homes uh, where they haven't had any parenting. And you know, when they go in the military today, and what I'm trying to do is prevent a million of them from being laid off. Close 74,000 jobs in GM plants, 3,400 in New York State. I'm trying to prevent one million from being laid off. Even under this plan, we're going to reduce that number 25%. And Mr. Bielenson, that's what my amendment calls for, a reduction in defense spending of 25%. Now, you know, those young men and women, they learn discipline and respect they learn how to be polite and courteous. They learn not how to use illegal drugs. They learn for the first time in their lives what law and order means, the living under the rule of law. You know, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about maintaining an adequate national defense. That's all this amendment does is say that we will go no further than a 25% cut in our defense budget. That's what the argument is. So I, I take a little... Uh, uh, I'm rich to, to Tony, with, to, you're saying, let's have heart. I think this amendment has heart. It protects the young people of our country who, when they get out of their military service, and hundreds of thousands of them every year are rotated through, they go back as peers in their community, and they teach these ingrained principles back to their peers back there. That's heart. That's why you all ought to support this amendment. May I reclaim my time, Mr. I, Chairman, just yeah. for a moment? Because I happen to agree, I happen to agree in substance with what my friend from from New York, my old home state, uh, says. Uh, and he speaks not only quite correctly to the, to the young men and women who are in the military service, who are su su superb people and whom we have to care about and take care of, in my opinion. Uh, you can extend it beyond that, Jerry. We're talking about people back home in all of our home states who are losing jobs or, or are fearful of losing jobs because of defense cutbacks. That happens to be the fact, and it happens to be a very sad fact, that at the same time that the Cold War has ended, uh, or is ending, and that it's, it's entirely proper 
and feasible for us to cut back in terms of our defense expenditures. Unfortunately, it you know, happens to happen at the exact same time when we're having a, a very difficult economic time back here at home and letting people out of the military or, or, or cutting off people's jobs in, in defense industries, unfortunately, tends to, to worsen this whole situation. What we're suggesting is, I, I suggest from the point of view of Tony Hall, who I thought made a superb uh, statement is that we use we use this money we be enabled to use this money for other than defense purposes that you take these same people whether they're they're well-trained scientists and engineers working back home in, in defense establishments or the young men and women mostly young men and women in our in our military services and enable them through economic conversion and investment in the future the kinds of jobs that we want to be uh, to be able to contribute to our to our economic ability and competitiveness here at home. That's all that we're suggesting, that we, that we take a modest amount of money from the so-called peace dividend from, from cutting in defense. Instead of continuing to spend it in defense where we can make an argument, I would say, I would suggest to my friend, that we don't need to spend quite so much as, as the, even the president now suggests we do, and use that money to use very many of these same people, hopefully, in, jo in jobs and in training and in areas where it makes a lot of sense and would be helpful to the people back home uh, in terms of uh, building our own economy, as well as as well as training these young men and women in jobs, which will which will give them something to do once uh, you know once their time in the military will have will have ended. So I don't think we're at we're at odds in terms of what we're trying to do or the people we're trying to help. Just in, just a question of whether we should continue to spend that money on military spending or on domestic spending. The gentleman yield. Be happy to. I thank the gentleman for yielding. You know I don't think any of us are sitting here and saying that we need to. Con continue to spend this money on the military budget because it's good for the economy. For goodness sakes, you know, we have spent the Soviet Union broke, the American taxpayers. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a Republican administration. The Republican administration just happened to be in office when it happened, but it's been Republicans and Democrats, Democratic Congresses for the last 40 years who have appropriated the money and allowed the strong defense uh, that, that kept the pressure on the Soviet Union. That's why it came down. But you know, we did great things after the Second World War. We really did. We, we rebuilt our enemies. We rebuilt our, our friends. We, we kept the pressure on the, on the Soviet Union. The American taxpayer did. But what we didn't do and what those who came before us didn't do, they didn't say when our allies and our enemies, when you become able to do it, then we're going to quit. And now we'll we're getting beat up around the world economically from a competitive basis. One of the reasons that we're doing it is because we spend seven or eight percent of our gross national product for national defense and uh, some of our competitors uh, in, in the nation's market spend one percent. Now the best thing that can happen to this country as far as strength of its ability to defend itself, its ability to provide for its citizens, is for us to cut that military budget back and to tell these other countries that they have to assume that responsibility. One of the reasons that we've become uncompetitive is that we have, have dedicated so much of our, uh, of, 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 of our goods and our services and our tax dollars to this. We've done it. We've done a good job. We ought to be commended. But now it's time to rebuild this country, and you can't rebuild it if you're going to be dealing with people who are spending 1 percent of their gross national product on national defense, and we continue to spend 7 or 8 percent. <coughs> the president, as far as I'm concerned, the idea, I think he wants to uh, reduce it, what is it, 7 or 8 percent uh, a year to master? I mean, that's ridiculous. That's ludicrous. I mean, the, the, we have spent in the last full budget that we had, is my understanding, 150 or $60 billion as a, to defend Europe against the Soviet Union. That no longer exists. We need to get on with, with the free enterprise system. We need to get along uh, with rebuilding this, this nation's economy. And the way we do it is not to continue to spend 7 or 8 percent of our gross national product on national defense. Gentlemen, yield. I'd be glad to yield. I thank my friend for yielding, and I would uh, just, in, in response to the, the opening statement about Democratic Congresses, which have provided us with the wherewithal well, to I mean, with Republicans over the years. And I didn't say just Democratic Well, you Congress, said Democratic but I Congress. Said Democratic Congress, I, but I we've been in control of this place. I think so give us some credit for what we've done. Well, let me tell you, I, I, will, I will give credit, <laughs> Butler. I will give credit, Butler, because I suspect that it has been those 40 Democrats who are co-sponsoring this amendment who, along with the Republican Congress over the past several years, 
provided the executive branch with the wherewithal to it has provide us with the ability the to have that victory years. over. It, it has not been the last several years. This is something that has gone in since, me, the, so on since the mid 1940s. But I mean, I, I, I will say this, though. Yes, you all have been in control for four decades, but the fact of the matter is, a majority of the Democrats have not supported what it is that, that you're is advocating Democrats. That is not true. If you'll go back and look at the well, I mean, we can go, we can go back and start Mr. looking at the systems during the, yeah. during the build-up. I, I, I think it's Tony's time. time. Actually, I was asking Tony. I'll reclaim yield. my time. If you'll go back and look at the congressional records over the last, since 1945, it has been the Democrats who, by and large, who have appropriated the money and set up the programs that brought about the demise of the Soviet Union, yeah. together with the Republicans. I'm not giving them all, but you know, give us a little, uh, a little credit. Ronald I have Reagan, given a little credit Ronald, to the 40 Ronald Democrats who joined and co-sponsoring this amendment. Ronald Reagan amendments. just happened to be in the White House when it all happened. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> he's lucky. He got there at the right time. You know, the other thing <laughs> that I would I say, I think that the gentleman I makes a very. Back my time. Oh, would the gentleman yield? I, uh, I, would, I, would, would the gentleman yield? yield? Yeah, I, think that the, I think that my friend makes a very good point when he advocates that we need to move towards a free enterprise system. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that Tony Hall made an excellent point about the fact that we do need to have concern for those who are less fortunate and those who are challenged. But I think that deficit reduction is going to provide a salutary effect to those who are in need because it's future generations that are going to be saddled with this responsibility. And I think it's very irresponsible of us to say that we're going to take this peace dividend and we're going to expend it on these domestic programs here. Why do I say that? Because the victory of the Cold War was an hour beating back those who want government control and totalitarianism. Those people, you know, I always am struck with the fact that we in the United States Congress seem to be creating what the rest of the world is fleeing. I mean, we have these people. We're celebrating the victory of the Cold War. The Berlin Wall comes down, and we want to advocate so much of what it is that these people were trying to get away from. And that's why I think this amendment is a very worthwhile one. No, let me tell you, I said 10 years ago that if the Soviet Union fell off the end of the earth, that the defense industry, together with some of their cohorts in the Congress, would find a way to keep the national uh, defense budget where it is, and I wasn't wrong. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, I've just been listening to this up until this point, <clears throat> but I do have a couple of observations. First of all, uh, I am one of the pro-defense Democrats who has consistently supported uh, a high level of appropriations and authorizations uh, all during the time that I've been in Congress. And I do not appear on that letter, Jerry, and there's some pretty good reasons, because we have an obligation now to retrain a lot of these people who are coming out of the military and who are losing their jobs in the defense industry. And I, I represent a lot of these people. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, heavy concentration of defense industry. And I don't think we can just turn our back on these folks and say, okay, you know, you've lost your jobs, but we're not going to put any money in the federal budget to retrain you, to provide aid to your communities, because we want to put it all in the deficit reduction. You, you all just go out and find jobs wherever you can. Now, I remember uh, my dad worked in the defense industry all his career. And I remember 25 years ago, my dad was out of work uh, because there was a downturn in the defense industry. But he had the chance a year later to go back and get a job in defense because we still had a high level of defense spending. Now we don't have that. And once these people lose their jobs, they're not going to get another job in the defense industry anytime soon. The engineers that I represent at LTV and General Dynamics and Bell Helicopter. And we've got to provide some money in the budget to provide training for them, uh, to provide job opportunities for them. I think Sen Senator Sam Nunn had an excellent idea, and you may even be supporting that, I don't know, of taking uh, people, kind of giving people early retirement from the military and giving them retraining to be teachers and to work in health professions and to work in other areas and to police law enforcement, but that takes money. And I think that there are a lot of programs that we need to increase the Job Training Partnership Act, which was a bipartisan bill, as you know. A lot, a lot of Republican support for that. We need to take some of this money that's been in the defense budget that's going to be cut, put some more money into JTPA, put some more money into a variety of creative things. We can't just take all this money 
and say every penny of it's going into deficit reduction and we don't care about all you highly trained people. Uh, a lot of white, white collar professionals, people in their 30s and 40s with families. We don't care about you people. We're not going to do anything for you. We've got an obligation to take some of this money put some of it in the deficit reduction and some of it into meaningful defense, defense conversion. And I'm afraid what you're, what you're advocating would prevent us from doing that. Would, would, would the gentleman yield? Yes. And, and first of all, I want to uh, pay tribute to the gentleman because he has been uh, uh, very strong uh, for national defense budgets and, uh, and certainly he represents his people well. I've, uh, I've visited those uh, military installations and uh, uh, those areas and I, and I know he's very well respected and I respect him for it. But you know, we have a budget of one and a half trillion dollars. And just for example, with the peacetime GI Bill, the Montgomery peacetime GI Bill, which gives young people $25,000 in accrued educational benefits. You know, if you're laying off 500,000 troops, 25%, you're going to have a tremendous savings just right there alone because you will have 500,000 or 25% and around this country is to get this economy going. You don't create public sector jobs, you create private sector jobs. And the way to do that is to cut that deficit. And every economist in this country agrees with that statement. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Jerry, if I would only add that I, I think we do need to cut the deficit. But I don't believe that you're going to have jobs for those people right away, even if you put every penny into deficit reduction. You've got to provide some retraining for a lot of those folks. You've got to take people who previously were designing airplanes and designing missile systems, and you've got to retrain them to do environmental cleanup, retrain them to be teachers in our public schools. You can't just cut the deficit and say, folks, there are going to be jobs for you in the private sector. Not all those people are going to find jobs, and a lot of those people are going to be, for the first first time in their lives out of work and seeking unemployment benefits and you and I don't want them to have to get unemployment benefits. We want them to be able to get a job. The gentleman yield one more time, uh, and I hate to take up the committee's time, but I know the gentleman is going to continue to vote for all of the research and development and experimentation money we need to continue to have our troops able to protect themselves in time of emergency like Desert Storm. You know, the F-111 uh, uh, stealth fighter bomber, the night vision, all of these things that we had, you know, held our casualties down to less than 500. God forbid there was any. We can't just abolish the defense budget and not having any of this in the pipeline that's going to continue to give us that kind of protection for these young men and women that are going to serve in the future. You know, uh, that's my point, is that we can't decimate the defense budget. Yes, we can cut it like I'm suggesting, 25% over the next five years, but we will still be able to maintain and we will still be able to keep those industries doing those things that are going to protect American Mr. lives. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't want to prolong this, but uh, as the gentleman from New York knows, I voted in favor of Operation Desert Storm, voted in favor of using our troops uh, in that area. Uh, hopefully we're not going to be doing that anytime soon anywhere else in the world. We need to be ready in the event that any emergency does come up, but there are going to be cuts in defense. The President says there are going to be cuts. We know there are going to be cuts. I'm only saying take some of that money that's being cut and let's give people jobs here in this country. Mr. Chairman, if I could brief, briefly ad address the question as to whether or not our defenses are destroying our competitiveness abroad, I would just like to add into the record at this point a, a chart from the Joint Commission on uh, Economic Report in which it points out that productivity in the 19, late 1970s was collapsing and was even negative uh, in 1979 and 80. But then during the 1980s, uh, productivity exploded and went up significantly. And of course, we grew more rapidly in, in productivity output per man hour than any place on the planet. And so therefore, there cannot be said that there was a direct correlation between defending America and our inability to be productive or to compete. Two quick uh, anecdotal references. In 1981, on January 20th, when Ronald Reagan was sworn into office on the steps of the Capitol, the first air tactical fighter squadron at Langley, of which there are three, three uh, squadrons, in that wing, 24 squadrons, 24 planes per squadron, three times 24 is 72. Of the 72 planes in that first air tactical fighter wing, only 50, uh, 51 of them were not airworthy. 51 of them couldn't fly. A uh, third of all of the people in the military uh, were using some sort of, uh, of drugs. Uh, 
and of course a third of the uh, planes and uh, in the Navy and in the ships uh, were not uh, couldn't be fully staffed and manned. In August 3rd 1991 or in part me 1990 when Saddam Hussein moved into Kuwait 14 hours after President Bush made a commitment to the Saudis to support them 14 hours after that decision was made in the White House, the first air tactical fighter squadron, having kissed their wives and hugged their children, and seven refuelings later, were on the ground in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that just ten years prior to that, uh, three, two out of the three planes couldn't even weren't even airworthy. So, uh, the defense buildup that changed the course of the world for freedom and democracy uh, was not uh, coincidental or accidental. It was because of decisions that were made, supported by leaders such as Martin Frost and others, that made it necessary. And as a result, so the position in which we are is a is one of which we can be proud. But I, I will take a great umbrage at the suggestion that America cannot p compete abroad because we chose to defend freedom at home. Gentlemen, yield just a moment. Please do. Uh, I voted to send the troops to the Gulf, too, but I hope the next time we have a vote like that, they'll always also give us a vote as to when we quit. Because, you see, uh, we didn't really go over there and accomplish what, what we started out to do, because Saddam Hussein is still reigning supreme over yeah. there. So give yeah. us a vote the on, gentleman on yield when we on get that. out of there, too. Uh, well, gentlemen, yield, I think we did. It's not my did. time. Uh, I'll, I'll yield and then I'll respond. I, I was just going to say that uh, we didn't go over there and accomplish what we set out to do. I thought that liberation of Kuwait was the priority, and from everything that I've that's seen... That's not what the president said when we went over there. Yes, he did. That's exactly I think he, what he that's said. That's exactly what In he fact, said. He was part of a 28-nation coalition that was I put together to do just that. I was pleased to be invited up to a briefing at the White House when they, they sent over there, and, and he, he said we were, the, the purpose was to get rid of Saddam Hussein and, and to get, get him out of Kuwait. And to abide by the law and the resolution. Well, uh, yeah. uh, let, let me, let me let, understand. People yeah. made mistakes, but I just want to bring that to you. Let me say this to my colleague, that I strongly agree with him. And I made the point early on that uh, un, unlike what, unlike what Mr. Uh, Mr. Bush, I'm not sure what all this argument has to do with the resolution I understand. that we're uh, settling here, but uh, anyway, it's uh, interesting. The question, the question has been broached, and I will respond, that I can completely concur with the gentleman from South Carolina. And many of us were very disappointed when the president articulated as his goals to support the UN resolutions and refuse to acknowledge the, I, the suggestion that Saddam Hussein should be removed. Unfortunately, he never made that a goal, and he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, pursue it. However, there are those that feel that, that he should have. Final point. In World War II, when we took out Adolf Hitler and destroyed the government, the responsibility and burden fell to the United States of America. And today, in 1992, as we sit here, there are 250,000 troops there as a remnant of that position to go in and destroy the government of Germany and take it over for the victors. The same thing happened in Japan. When we destroyed the government of Japan, the General MacArthur then became the ruling dictator in Japan in, in order to set up the government. The question that George Bush made and the decision that he made, uh, obviously without the concurrence of all in this committee, his decision was that having accomplished his goal, he would not then destroy the government of Iraq, place the American soldiers in there as occupying forces until such time as a new government is established, and allow them to be cannon fodder for every terrorist sniper that was in Baghdad. Now, that was a decision that he made, and I su suspect that if it were put to a vote as to whether or not those soldiers that were banging on my, their wives banging on our doors saying, when are they coming home, if they were going to be there for two or three years to occupy Iraq, uh, I suspect that uh, there would have been a strong sentiment that the president's decision at that point might have been correct. But you just said that you disagreed with his decision. I would have taken out Saddam Hussein on day one. What, in my what, what, what you wanted, you wanted both ways. No, what I wanted to, I, I would have paid, I would say to this, to the gentleman from South Carolina who raised the issue and wanted it both ways, is that I would have been willing to pay the price. I would have been willing to do the things that I suggested. George Bush wasn't. And I believe most of the American people agree with him. Would and the gentleman not, yield? Not with me. I'll be pleased to Would yield. Would the gentleman yield? You know, I felt the same way the gentleman did at the time. And I talked to the President of the United States about this. And he posed the question to me, Jerry. He said, you know, we, if we're faced with this situation again, where we have to rally some other Arab countries to our side, let's, and he posed the question at the time, suppose that country is Iran. 
Now, if we break the UN resolution and if we go against these Arab allies that have come with us, which was the greatest act of diplomacy, I think, in the history of this country, in getting those countries to stick with us against their own brothers over there, if we had broken our promise and had not lived up to the UN resolution, they never would have trusted us again. And when we needed them to counter Iran, which is going to happen, or to cancel Syria when they go into Israel or wherever it may be, we wouldn't have stood a chance. So that's why I supported the president in stopping where he did. Mr. Chairman. And good thing he did. I think the chair has given wide latitude in this debate. I think we've, we've gone through history. I, I would like to get back to the Michael Amendment. Mr. Billinson. No, sorry, I was just about to say, it's nice having television here, Mr. Chairman, but this turning into a little Hyde Park corner we're discussing just about everything in the world. We do have an I, amendment. I, I, we have the gentleman's amendment before us, and perhaps, you know, if there's no more discussion, we could vote on it one of these days. As a representative of Hyde Park, New York, the home of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I would move my amendment. And I know he'd support it if he were president. I, th I thought you were going to say you're going to move your, re your residence. <laughs> Question comes on the amendment of uh, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Michael. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Those appear to have it. The amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, with all respect, I would ask for a recorded vote of my amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick? No. Mr. Bielinson? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? Mr. Hall? No. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, three members having voted in the affirmative, eight in the negative, the amendment of General Miyak in Illinois is not passed. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> I have another amendment which has been distributed before you, which deals with a line item veto giving the President special rescission authority uh, and ask for permission to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Billinson? Uh, before, before the Chair proceeds, I'd like to at this point make a point of order that the Mr. Solomon's amendment you is. reserve a point of order? No, no, no. Do you want me to reserve it at this yes. point? Yeah, well, just Okay, I reserve a point of order against the amendment. I, I thank the gentleman very much. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be as brief as I can. I'm offering this amendment to give the President's special rescission authority on behalf of myself and Representative Jimmy Duncan of Tennessee and uh, my good friend uh, Congressman Dreyer uh, sitting next to me here. Uh, who has introduced this uh, as a bill in the House along with some 120 co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle. It is identical to a bill, an amendment offered in the other body by Senator McCain of uh, Arizona, which I think just barely failed uh, the other day on the, on the floor of the other body over there. Uh, this special rescission authority would be in addition to the regular rescission authority the President now enjoys under Title 10 of the Budget Act, whereby any rescissions proposed by the President must be approved by both houses and signed into law. By contrast, this special rescission authority reverses that process in specified circumstances, and it allows the rescissions to take effect unless both houses disapprove the rescission and the disapproval becomes law, either with the President's approval or uh, with his veto. Mr. Chairman, a special rescission message may only be submitted by the President up to 20 calendar days after a regular supplemental or continuing appropriation measure becomes law or is submitted in a special message to accompany the President's budget submission to the Congress. The recession would become effective unless Congress presents to the President a rescission disapproval bill within 20 calendar days after the submission of his rescission message and it becomes law with a, his approval or by virtue of a veto override within five days of the session after it is vetoed. I've offered this as an amendment to the firewall demolition bill here today, reported by the Government Operations Committee that we're considering, and it seems to me that if the Congress wants to break the enforcement agreement that it struck with the President and with the American people back in October of 1990, it should be willing to give the President something in return. 
And this special rescission authority just might induce the president to sign this bill, in case any of you are interested in him really signing it, so long as he knows he has the ability to strike down any excess spending that might emerge from the ashes of the firewalls. If Congress is so intent on burning down the spending firewalls, then it should be willing to give the President of the United States, whoever he is, a chance to incinerate its pork on his special rescission grill. Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, I can't think of a better way to maintain fiscal discipline in, this, in the face of renewed pressures to increase spending and the deficits once we abandon the 1990 firewalls. I hope my colleagues will support this amendment. Uh, I think it's only fair. Yes, I yield to the gentleman from California. I thank my friend for yielding, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this amendment. Uh, but I should say we should, we should add at least two other names as co-sponsors of this amendment. You mentioned it as the Solomon Duncan Dreyer Amendment. I think it should be the Solomon Duncan Dreyer Songus Clinton Amendment, as the two uh, of the Democratic presidential candidates are strong proponents of the line item veto. And if they were here, they would want to be co sponsors of your amendment, I'm sure. And I think that uh, as we look at the challenge that we have when it comes to deficit reduction, we've seen a wide range of uh, items that are clearly waste, fraud, and abuse that have been incorporated in some of these appropriations bills. I think of the Department of Transportation, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, there are little items that are often stuck in in conference reports that uh, the joint House Senate conferees meet. And uh, then they stick these items in, and the President has a simple choice of either signing it or vetoing it. And obviously, he's really forced into a corner there. So I think that. Uh, uh, when, when one looks at the fact that the rescission authority that the President did have was dramatically reduced in 1974, and when we have President Bush and uh, presidential aspirants on the other side of the aisle, as I say, Clinton and Songus uh, wanting this, it seems to me that there should be a little disagreement here in this committee. And I'm <coughs> proud to be along with Mr. Songus and Mr. Clinton, also with Mr. Solomon, a co-sponsor. Well, I, I thank the gentleman for his, his support. And let me just say that uh, uh, what this does, is this puts members of Congress on the line. You know, in 1974, when Richard Nixon tried not to spend all of the money that was appropriated when it wasn't needed for various programs, and this Congress took him to the United States Supreme Court, and he was ordered to spend every nickel. Now. Bureaucrats in every agency at the end of the fiscal year rush to spend all the money or else the president asks for rescission. But we gutless members of Congress don't have to take any action. What, and, it, and it's beaten. What this does is reverse that. It says, okay, members of Congress, if you want the president to spend the money now that he's asking for this rescission, you vote on it and tell him to do it. That's only fair, and that's what the American people expect. It's not and that's only what that, my amendment does. It, it's, it's not only that, but it, it, not just the expenditures for their own operations, but when you look at a lot of sort of pet projects which are incorporated in there, too, I mean, that's a, a, an important part of it, which we can't ignore. And that's really what the president wants to get at in this. And I think that, that Clinton, in his direct quote in saying, this is the only way that we can really turn the corner on wasteful government spending, that's exactly what he wants to target also. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. I yield back my time. Mr. Billington, do you insist on your point of order? I do, Mr. Chairman. Would you like me to make my point of order? Um, is the gentleman going to insist on his point of order? Yes, he is. Well, Mr. Chairman, I was going to uh, rebut the point of order, but um, uh, what I'll do is reserve, if it's all right with the committee, I'll just reserve my right when the Rules Committee meets to uh, present a rule to the House. And uh, I would at that time uh, try to offer my, my line out of veto amendment. And I won't take the committee's time right now, and I appreciate your indulgence. I would, uh, if the gentleman insists on uh, his point of order, I would withdraw the amendment at this time. Yes, the gentleman does insist. I would withdraw the amendment. Thank the gentleman. The question now comes on the substitute the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I have an amendment I'd like to offer here. So I, I wasn't aware of that, was it? Uh, well, I, I wasn't aware of it when I started out this morning either, but I, I just to uh, put this together. Mr. McEwen and I would like to offer uh, an amendment which uh, on page 4, following line 10, we had the following new section which says, uh, section 4, repeal of tax increases, strike Title 11 of the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990, 
and it repeals, since we're making such modifications in the budget summit agreement, it seems to me that, that one of the things that had been a major concern to us, and quite frankly the reason that the three of us voted against that agreement was the fact that this tax provision was in there. President Bush supported the budget summit agreement for one simple reason, and that was the fact that we were going to be able to maintain the other, uh, the spending cuts, and he, he went along with this, and so it seems to me that this is uh, um, very much in order, and I urge my colleagues support of it. Uh, the, the gentleman realizes that since it affects uh, more than the, uh, the year 1990, in 1993, that it, it, it's not Germanic. Oh, okay. Would the gentleman yield? I have to yield my um, I reserve the right, uh, for what that's worth, to, to offer my amendment on line item veto when we mark up the rule, uh, presumably sometime next week, and I might suggest the gentleman might want to pursue it at that time, and I certainly would support him. I'll If the, if, if the gentleman insists on his point of order, uh, his amendment to point of order would lie against this. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, may I just reserve the right to, when we consider the rule on this, to uh, bring this issue up? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any other amendments? question now comes from the amendment of the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No! The ayes have it. The amendments, no. Do we have a question? Comes, it's just an original yes, jurisdiction. Sir. Question comes on appointing the, uh, 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 the uh, amendment as amended. The motion as amended. All, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, may we have a roll call vote? Chair will call the roll. Mr. Derrick? Aye. Mr. Bielinson? Aye. Mr. Frost? Aye. Mr. Bonner? Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Wheat? Aye. Aye. <laughs> you voted for my amendment. <laughs> Mr. Gordon? I stand with Aye. Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Solomon? No. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. McEwen? No. no. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Seven members have voted in the affirmative, three in the negative of the motion uh, of the General of South Carolina is adopted. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Solomon. Uh, I would like to request, pursuant to an earlier staff level uh, discussion that uh, that our staff had, that the minority have until noon time tomorrow, March 4th, to file minority views on the bill just reported. If that's all right. No objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Good. Let me just say, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, I had a bout with flu, and it put me in bed for a while, and it was a tough thing to deal with. I know that you've been under the weather and have a little flu today, and I want to thank you for, for gutting out and putting up with us and staying this entire time, because I know it's no fun and it's difficult to have to do this when you're feeling the way I felt uh, a few weeks ago. Well, thank, I thank the gentleman. You're not, you're not giving me the flu, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, what, the committee will when, 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 when might we? Two o'clock. Okay. Thank you for putting that up. We will return to our coverage of today's House Rules Committee meeting in just a moment. C-SPAN is your primary source for election coverage. To get the most from our programming about the presidential campaign, C-SPAN offers Race to the Nomination, a new publication written